Hello developers and welcome to another video on building serverless applications on AWS. In this video, we're going to continue the journey into Rust and serverless. Yes, all you Rustations out there are non-Rustations. There's going to be something in this video to you. We're going to talk about the project structure that you should look at when you're building production ready serverless applications with Rust. That's going to cover how to structure your project files, how to structure your actual application, working with things like the CDK and how all of this can work together using features of the Rust language like workspaces and other things like that. And to talk through this, I want to keep talking about a book I have been raving about recently. One of my favorite programming books ever written, and that is Zero to Production Rust by Luca Palmieri. Fantastic book. If you're trying to learn Rust, this is one for you. Thank you, Luca, if you're watching for all of your amazing work in this space. And what we are going to take is the example from the Zero to Production book and make that completely serverless. And the example in the book is a newsletter subscription service. It allows people to subscribe to emails. And then there's an admin dashboard that allows you to actually send out newsletters and it's all one big monolithic application in the actual book and i really recommend still checking out the book even though we're going to talk through some of the contents here the book is a much deeper deep dive into these ideas but we're going to break this apart into a couple of different pieces so we're going to have an entire actix web application running inside lambda that's going to be the gateway that's going to be the front end application that's going to host the html the website any requests that come in to authenticate to subscribe to actually send newsletters and then this web application is going to store data in S3, actual newsletter information, the content of a newsletter. And there's also a DynamoDB table for data to be stored in as well. Now, when data gets stored in that DynamoDB table, that table has DynamoDB streams enabled and data is streamed out to a couple of different places. If the record that gets stored is a new subscriber. So somebody actually comes on and says, I want to subscribe to this newsletter because this newsletter is amazing. Hopefully you might think that you want to do that after watching this video. That then gets taken out into this little section here, this separate microservice that sends out an email asking somebody to, to confirm their subscription. So you've all been there when you subscribe to something, you get an email saying, please click this link to subscribe to confirm. That is exactly what's going on here. The second thing that's hooked up to this stream is when a new newsletter is added. So I go in as an administrator, I want to send a new newsletter, data gets stored in Dynamo, then gets stored in my newsletter table. And if it's a newsletter record, it comes along this stream here into my newsletter sender service, which then actually sends the emails out to my subscribers. So we're taking this monolithic application, we're making it completely serverless, and we're also splitting that into microservices. Over 70% of you watching this video aren't yet subscribed to this channel, and it would mean the absolute world to me if you were to like and subscribe. One of the reasons I do what I do is to produce content that matters to all of you sat in front of your laptops or phones listening to this. And one of the ways I get feedback on if you're enjoying it is the likes, the comments, and the subscribe. So I'd really, really appreciate it if you'd hit that like button, hit that notification bell, add a comment. I'd love to hear from you. Back to the video. And let's start with the discussion about how you're actually going to deploy this. Because when you're deploying serverless applications to AWS, you've got a few different choices from an infrastructure as code perspective. Remember, this is production-ready serverless Rust. So infrastructure as code is vital for that. You've got the CDK, you've got AWS SAM, you've got third-party tools like Pulumi and Terraform. Now, I'm a fan of the CDK. Regardless of what you might read on social media, I'm still a big fan of it because it allows you to keep code all the way down. When you're building serverless applications, your infrastructure code is application code. Your decision to choose SQS or SNS or EventBridge or Kinesis, that is an application decision, not an infrastructure decision. So I'm a big fan of the CDK because it allows you to keep writing code at all layers of the stack. Now, where this gets interesting with Rust is that there isn't a CDK for Rust. So this is one of the downsides, and I called this out in my last video on the pros and cons of Rust and serverless, that if you are using the CDK with Rust, you will have to use a different programming language. And I've chosen to use TypeScript in this case, just because a lot of the documentation out there around the CDK is in TypeScript. It does make things a little bit simpler. So let's come back to this actual project structure now. And this is at the top level. I'm in Visual Studio Code here just to kind of talk about what exactly is going on. 
So you see at the top level here, I've got a CDK folder and I've got a source folder. So the CDK folder, as you might imagine, is where I actually store all of the CDK code. And I've got a couple of different a couple of different stacks here. I've got a stack for the actual API. You see, I've got my newsletter API there. I've got the stack for processing new subscribers, and I've got the stack for sending the newsletters, them two separate backend microservices. And one of the really th cool things about using the CDK is that there are actually Rust CDK constructs out there. I'm, us I'm using this really fantastic Rust function construct developed by Steve Howell. This is in, currently in CDK Labs, so it's not actually V1 yet, but it does allow you to build Rust applications as part of the CDK. This uses Zig under the hood to support things like cross compilation. So I'm running a M2 Mac here. I could set this to be a x86 Lambda function and this Rust function construct would manage that. And you'll notice I'm specifying the entry point. I'm specifying a cargo.toml file to actually use. And that's what this Rust function is going to be compiled from. And as you can imagine, the same applies in these new the new subscriber stack and the send newsletter stack. I'm still using the Rust function construct. Obviously, the environment variables here are slightly less. So that is the CDK side of things. And again, I'm using TypeScript here. It's one of the downsides, one of the trade-offs you'll have to make if you want to use the CDK and Rust because there isn't a Rust CDK. Um, so then let's look at the actual application code now. So if I look under my source folder now, and actually to show you this, I'm going to flip over to Rust Rover and get out of Visual Studio Code. This is my favorite IDE for building Rust applications. And one of the things I'm using that you'll notice immediately is I'm using this workspaces feature of Cargo and Rust. So I can actually create a Cargo Toml file at the very top level and just say, actually this, this workspace, this set of Rust applications is in three parts. I've got the API, the back end, and then I've got some cross-cutting concerns around telemetry in its own separate crate. And this allows the IDE and Cargo to actually know exactly where all your applications sit. So you'll see at the top level here, I've got my two separate microservices, if you will. I've got the actual API itself. I've got the backend application, the backend Lambda functions, and then I've got some cross-cutting concerns in a telemetry crate. And each of these obviously all have their own independent cargo.toml files. And when you look at the cargo.toml files in these subdirectories, this will be more like what you're familiar with. It's got actually all the dependencies that the application has. If I look at my backend one, you see all the dependencies, dev dependencies, features, all of that good stuff. And then if you look in the actual um, API directory and you'll have a look at the project structure here, I've split this down roughly into what you might call a clean architecture or a hexagonal architecture or whatever architecture buzzword name that you want to use. I've got my API roots. I've got any adapters, any implementation details. And then I've got some domain specific stuff, you know, the actual subscriber data, newsletter data, and things like that. And everything actually gets initialized in this startup class. So I'm using a form of dependency injection here in Rust. So I configure, if I just scroll down through here, I configure my newsletter store, my DynamoDB repositories, my DynamoDB clients, all this gets configured once in the application startup. And then I use a feature of Actix called the app data to actually inject these implementations as part of the application data. So then when I come to one of my routes, let's have a look at the subscribe route, for example, I can actually inject, if I scroll down to my subscribe method, I can actually inject my subscriber repository into this method and Actix handles the rest. This is a way you can use a form of dependency injection inside your Rust applications using this feature of Actix to allow you to inject this application data. And the same applies for the actual backend Lambda function as well. If I look in my backend folder now, remember I've got my own independent cargo.toml file, completely independent from that API one, albeit there is some crossover. One interesting thing with this cargo.toml file is I'm actually using this feature of cargo that allows you to specify different binaries. So I've got two separate completely independent binaries here. One for my send confirmation lambda and one for my send newsletter lambda. And if I actually look under my source and bin folder, you see these two lambda functions here. And this allows you to generate two independent binaries, which of course, when you're building with lambda, will then indicate two separate Lambda functions. So if you are deploying multiple Lambda functions in the same Rust application, sharing a cargo.toml file, you will need to probably use this binary feature of cargo to actually specify your two separate binaries. And then each of them independent binaries has its own async main function. That's actually going to be the entry point. So I look at my send confirmation. I look at my send newsletter. They've both got this main method. 
So let's just focus on the send confirmation. Again, I'm doing a similar kind of thing that I was with Actix, setting up some stuff for a form of dependency injection here. So I'm creating my email clients. I'm creating all of my DynamoDB uh, config, my DynamoDB clients. And then I'm using the Lambda Rust runtime. I'll put a link to that in the description to actually run a function handle. And I'm trying to keep idiomatic as you would with Lambda here. So I've got a function called function handler. And if you look at my send newsletter, I've also got a function called function handler. And this allows this kind of main startup -y type code to stay the same between both Lambda functions. And then if I'm coming and looking at this, trying to work out what this Lambda function does, I can jump straight to my function handler method. And then inside my function handler, this is an SQS source Lambda function. So I'm iterating over the SQS messages and then I pass them off to this handle record function. And this handle record function is actually the business logic. All this stuff above here that you can see is actually me setting up tracing. So this uses open telemetry. I'll cover that in the next video but using open telemetry here to actually send trace data to an open telemetry compatible backend. So I set up my tracing. I actually parse the trace data from the message that gets sent into SQS. This allows me to continue the trace from my API through to my actual message processor. And again, you will see that in the next video. And then I can go off and actually handle the record. So this is the backend applications. And because both of these Lambda functions share the capability to send emails. That's why I'm deploying them both as an independent unit. Both of these applications get deployed together because really they are both responsible for sending emails. So I can package this email sending client. I'm using Postmark for sending emails here. I can package that functionality to send an email into a single function. And then both of these send confirmation and send newsletter handlers can use that same functionality. And then finally, at the very top level here, I've got this telemetry create. I'm going to cover this in more detail in the next video, talking about observability and instrumentation. But just know I've got this create, this telemetry create, and in both my backend and my API function, I reference that telemetry create using the path structure there. So this allows me to have this cross-cutting concerns, things like observability and telemetry are really good for doing stuff like that. And that is really at a high level, the structure of a Rust project. Now, of course, in the real world, that API and backend functionality could be two separate repositories, two completely independent microservices. But actually here, although they are two independent microservices linked by a queue, I'm choosing to deploy them both together because they are similar functionality and partly to make things easier for me because then I've just got a single CDK project. I can just run CDK deploy and get all of this functionality out into AWS. So that's the first video on this Rust series to give you a kind of high level look at the project structure, the application use case and how this is going to work going forward. As I've said in the next video, you're going to learn about observability, open telemetry, and how to work out how to use open telemetry inside the context of Rust and AWS Lambda. I'll see you all there.